Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night's Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension here at UW-Madison. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Rock Mackey. He's the Chief Innovation Officer at UW Health and is a professor emeritus in the departments of engineering physics and medical physics. He was born in Eston, Saskatchewan in the Prairie Provinces and went to high school in Saskatoon. And then he uh, got his undergraduate degree in physics at the University of Saskatchewan and then moved a little bit west to go to the University of Alberta where he got his PhD in physics. Then he came here to UW-Madison in 1987 uh, to be in the Department of Medical Physics. And then uh, he, in 2010 to 2015, he moved over to the Morgridge Institute for Research, and he retired. And then earlier this year, he got pulled out of retirement to become the Chief Innovation Officer at UW Health. Tonight he's going to talk with us about something that's uh, distinguishing here at this university and in many other places, fueling academic entrepreneurship. We've had talks on great historic talks on Steenbach and vitamin D and Carl Paul Wink and warfarin. Tonight we get to hear about how this ship of enterprise sails in today's seas. So please join me in welcoming Rock Mackey to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Thank you, Thomas. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is a great program uh, and uh, I uh, uh, I'm honored to be here uh, talking to you. Uh, I'd like to start by dedicating this to a good friend, uh, Mark Cook. Probably many of you knew uh, Mark. He, he passed away uh, recently. But Mark was a great uh, scientist, uh, but also a, a, a well, wonderful human being and a great scientist, but he was also a very good entrepreneur. And uh, in, in dedication to him, is he used to say to me, he said, if you know, if we could get if we could harvest the crap from a chicken and keep the chicken alive, we'd make more money uh, out of the chicken crap than we would out of uh, killing and uh, frying up the chicken. Uh, and he was very interested in uh, the chemicals um, that are produced. So in honoring Mark Cook, I'm going to rename it Fertilizing uh, Academic <laughs> Entrepreneurship. So I, of course, uh, a part of the uh, conflict management at a university, you have to disclose your relationships. So I've had a lot of relationships with companies over the years as a, as a consultant, uh, as a company founder on boards of companies. And so I guess this is one talk in which all of this is not a, a threat, but a good thing. Um, first of all, I think it's important to remember that faculty aren't, are rarely, uh, purely, uh, solely pure uh, uh, professors of a field or applied professors of a field. Most professors think of themselves in some way as being both, uh, if, if you like, basic scientists uh, as well as applied scientists. Uh, and, and it tilts a little bit. Uh, the humanities, they tend to think of themselves as maybe pure basic, um, whereas over in agriculture and, and, and uh, medical sciences, maybe a little bit more pure applied. But most scientists are somewhere in the middle. Um, and they're uh, equally basic um, and, uh, and applied. So I think it's important to know that. We're really talking about what applied scientists will do, or applied engineers will do, or applied faculty will do. So it turns out that the main motivation for academic entrepreneurs uh, is not uh, to make money. Uh, at least that's what they say. Um, the main factor really is to see their ideas actually out in the world uh, and doing and doing good, um, and that uh, and that's true in a study in, in this in 2010, but it was also true in an earlier study, uh, found that non-economic motives tend to be more important to entrepreneurs than economic, or at least academic entrepreneurs than than uh, than economic ones, and the three most important uh, motives are autonomy, really controlling something you're fully yourself, and the achievement of seeing your ideas put to practice and job satisfaction. And in my case, it was, uh, it was, it was 
I became an entrepreneur not because I wanted to make money. I, I, I did it to complete projects because the pro projects would have ended if, uh, if it, it was, wasn't passed into a company. I want to ask you and get the audience to say, who are the most entrepreneurial faculty in a university? Is it the business school faculty? Is it life sciences faculty? Are, is it the engineers? Medical researchers? Or just completely outside the box, fine arts faculty? Who, who are the most entrepreneurial? Well, I mean, has, are, are engaged with society in selling, in selling something, I guess. The most basic. Well, it turns out it's fine arts. And it turns out that business school faculty are rarely entrepreneurs themselves. Right? And that's because there's tremendous pressure in the business school um, to, to study entrepreneurship or study business. But they're really discouraged from getting involved in business. And, and I only know one entrepreneur in our business school um, who, who is a co-founder of an incubator called, uh, called uh, Generator. Um, in fact, fine arts faculty are 100% entrepreneurs. Now, why is that? Well, no, I mean, it's really basic. It's really basic. Why are they hired? Why are they hired? Why is a fine arts professor hired? Because they, they do something that people find attractive or the performance exciting. Uh, so they're already engaged with society as entrepreneurs. And the best of them, if they want, they can become professors and teach, and teach their craft to their students. Right? They may have a grant. To, to, to pay for the materials for oil painting, and they would paint in front of their student. But that canvas isn't going on, sitting on a university wall. It's going back to their studio, and it's being, it's being sold, likely, in their studio. So, so by definition, they're engaged with society as artists, and they're engaged as well in teaching art to the students. So there's no such thing as an ivory tower artist, by definition, right? So the Wisconsin idea is, is really uh, central, I think, to this campus. Um, never, be, never be content until the beneficent influence, I love that word, beneficent influence of the university reaches every family in the state. And the classic one, of course, is dairy farming. In, in, the, in about 1880, uh, a sixth of the wheat grown in the U.S. came from Wisconsin, and Milwaukee was our leading grain port. Unfortunately, we have pretty light soil, and so wheat's hard on soil. I'm from a wheat-producing area as well, but the soil is a, has a lot more clay, a lot more substance, and can tolerate wheat growing. And uh, <clears throat> the UW School of Agriculture began to promote dairy farming to put fertilizer back into the light soil and to hold, hold the soil in place. Uh, Henry uh, discovered or perfected the round grain silo as we know it, as we see it today. Uh, Babcock developed the butterfat test, uh, and pioneering tests for bacteria led, led for practical ways of pasteurization. And in, by 1915, Wisconsin was the leading dairy state in the nation, producing more butter and fat than any other state. So clearly, the, the School of Agriculture was deeply engaged in uh, taking ideas and, and out to the state and using them in practical ways. Let's, uh, let's take a look at, uh, at innovation in terms of a measure of R&D. Uh, and this is from a, a science article um, in, in 2013. The big blue blob there, by the way, the axes, the Y axis um, is, the number, is, the, is the number of scientists and engineers uh, per million people. And so up in this axis is more scientists. And al along the X axis, along the bottom, the horizontal axis, is the, is the uh, R&D percent of GDP. And that big blue blob is the United States, sitting at about 2.5% of GDP is research and development. And, other, and you can see there's almost a linear line up there. Uh, the more scientists, the more, the more money being spent on, on research and development in general. And the U.S. has been like this for a long time. It's been spending about 2.5% of its GDP uh, at least since the 60s, rising and falling by a few tenths of a percent. But what has really changed is the proportion of industry funding as opposed to U.S. federal funding. Uh, it was once two-thirds. During the Nassau period, it was two-thirds of, uh, uh, of uh, 
the uh, total R&D spending. And now it's down. Uh, now it's down about 20 percent. In fact, I have have I went to the to the, the data to complete the last few few years, and you see that that last little will look like a peak is actually steadily dropping down down to about 20 percent. So industry now is is where the federal government was in terms of research and development funding, uh, not the federal government. So. We have to be engaged with industry. If we want to get uh, our research and development done, scientists and engineers and, and medical researchers have to engage with industry. If we look at our budget over time, you'll see the state support, by the way, for the university has dropped from, from 43% um, just before I came here. Uh, now it's down to, uh, it's now down to about 14, 15%. You'll notice that there's two things that have risen here, um, the gifts and grants, in other words, uh, re uh, research uh, from the federal government as well as industry, uh, and you'll see also tuition. But we all, we all say the tuition has risen steeply, right, because the state, state has stopped funding us, but the, even more so, uh, it's, it's R&D, uh, uh, it's the research and development, and we've been particularly successful at this university uh, in, in doing that. So the role of academia and industry is, I think, uh, much like a, um, a mine and a mill. So ideas uh, tend to come, um, the, especially the breakthrough, the disruptive ideas, uh, are coming from academia. But they need to get implemented and refined in a, in a company. And uh, I like to say the mill won't last long if there's no mine, but a mill is required really to get the product to market, to refine the ideas. So the, the ingredients for excess, a successful university is, uh, is excellent facilities, uh, decent funding, but excellent faculty, staff, and trainees. And, and maybe trainees are the most important. The better students you have, the better uh, the science is going to be. And the result of that, the Venn diagram of putting all that together in the center, the, the, the uh, union, uh, uh, or sorry, the intersection of that are, are ideas generated. And the reason that universities and business are, are, are close together is that ideas is the feedstock for successful business. So there, it's the, it's the, it's the um, intersection of ideas, investment, and excellent management and staff that produce profitable sales. So that's why industry wants or needs uh, universities, especially for new ideas that are disrupt the marketplace. Here's the situation in Palo Alto. Okay, this is Silicon Valley. So they have, they have two great universities, um, UCSF uh, and Stanford. Um, they have lots of capital uh, and lots of, uh, especially entrepreneurial management. And fortunately, this is the situation in Wisconsin. Our idea, we don't lack ideas. In fact, if you take, if you take the spending from UCSF and Stanford, uh, we're very close to the, the sum of those two. Uh, we don't have capital, or not much capital. In fact, when I started uh, 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 here, we had only one venture capital firm. At least in Madison now, we have four venture capital firms uh, that, that, are least, that are funding uh, medicine, which, by the way, is more than, uh, more than uh, Minneapolis. We actually have more venture capital now here than, than Minneapolis for, the, for life sciences and medicine. Management isn't bad, right? We have some great industries. Uh, especially, well, my field especially, the, the, the second largest medical device uh, company in the world is based in Waukesha, Wisconsin, General Electric. And uh, the, the largest Medtronic is in Minneapolis. And of course we have Epic, which is the largest healthcare IT company in the world, in Madison. So of course, lots of great ideas, lots of great apl applied ideas. Um, we'll go straight out to large companies, industry. And, and I borrow, uh, the, the examples here are all going to be from my department. This is uh, Chuck Mastretta, um, who with Andy Crummy, uh, the, who was, uh, became the chair of radiology, developed what's called digital subtraction angiography. So you actually took then a picture um, of the patient without contrast, then you took another picture with contrast, and subtracting the two, you, you highlighted the contrast. And if the contrast is going through the vascular system, you suddenly can see very easily at relatively low doses to the patient uh, all of the vessels very beautifully. 
And this changed what's called interventional radiology. In fact, interventional radiology really didn't exist until Chuck Mistretta's invention. And uh, so, so pre-1972, this was uh, their uh, interventional lab, very chaotic. And then uh, the uh, modern uh, C-arm radiography system that could swoop around a patient became uh, commonplace. And this is used to guide, for example, li uh, little wires that are going through your vascular system, for example, for placing a stent into your heart. Uh, or for on, on, on plugging uh, uh, other arteries, or for actually going in and, uh, and determining um, sampling and biopsying inside, inside you. Um, the CT scanner has started to, to uh, take over this role too, uh, and so the interventional suite is changing. And all of these inventions were developed at the University of Wisconsin, and all licensed uh, non-competitively non to all of the major companies, Philips, Siemens, and General Electric, so a non-exclusive licenses. And again, this university has, has transformed this whole field. In fact, Chuck Mistretta's group. So in fact, the University of Wisconsin Medical Physics Department has had, had a lot of spin-offs companies. The first uh, spin-off was called Lunar Corporation. It was started by Dick Mazes. Uh, Dick Mazes, who actually wasn't a medical physicist, uh, he was an archaeologist, uh, an anthropologist, and, but uh, he was interested in bone. And so the, found, the founder of uh, medical physics, uh, John Cameron, uh, hired him because of his, no his knowledge of bones because he had an idea for, um, for a bone mineral densitometry system to determine what, what the density of your bone, bones are so that you could, you could determine if you were at risk for a fracture. And in fact, it's become a standard, a standard thing. As you get older, you're, you get a bone, a bone min mineral test. Uh, Lunar Corporation was the first one to develop uh, a system for that. Um, it ended up spinning off companies. Uh, bone Care um, was a, uh, a drug company. Um, in fact, Hector DeLuca's uh, Hectorol was its main, um, main selling component. Uh, 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 John Cameron also founded Radiation Measurements Inc., which was a not-for-profit. John, John would say, What's the, if I don't need an, an investment, what the, why, why would I want to have a for-profit company when I can just build the company as a not-for-profit? I'm still paying myself, um, and I could pay graduate students um, uh, to work at, at the company. Um, and then uh, when it was sold, um, it's now still run in, in Madison by a company called Sun Nuclear. Um, he started Medical Physics Publishing Corporation. He donated his money for that. Um, I started Ge Geometrics, and I'll tell the story about that and, and, and tomotherapy. Uh, but still, the spin-offs come. There's uh, AIQ uh, is, um, is, a, is a company that um, is... Um, has just been offered a Series A financing in town and, uh, and two others in, in the pipeline. But the, what's important to show here is that spin-off companies beget others, if they're successful, beget other spin-off companies. And you then form a nucleus, an, e an ecosystem. So my first company uh, was called Geometrics. We had developed uh, the second uh, stereotactic radio surgery system uh, in the country here. Uh, and we didn't have a treatment planning system, a planning system that could calculate the radiation dose uh, from stereotactic radiosurgery. Um, and so a very clever um, young programmer by the name of Mark Gehring um, uh, and, and I and, and two others combined uh, to, um, to produce a system that was operating at, at the University of Wisconsin um, because at that point in time you could write software and you didn't have to be FDA approved for software. So this, uh, we, we, uh, we were uh, treating patients from 88 through to, uh, to uh, 1992. Uh, and the FDA said, well, oh, we tried to give away the software. So we, we actually had a workshop and we invited six, uh, six centers, including Mayo, to come and take away the software. And the FDA heard about it and said, well, that's fine, but, um, but now you have to get it FDA approved. So we went to the hospital, UW Health, well, UW Hospital then, it wasn't UW Health, and said, you know, give us a little bit of money, we'll get it FDA approved, and, and you can sell it. We'll find some way to sell it. 
uh, or get somebody to buy it. And they weren't interested in that, but they said, well, but thank you very much. Uh, you've reminded us that you've done a great job here, but the programmers that we hired uh, who did this, we have a little bit of a budget cut going on, and unfortunately, we have to lay those guys off. So Geometrics was actually um, was taken out of uh, the UW hospital and turned into a company. The chairman of uh, our department kicking and screaming because he felt it was his company. It should be his company. But the university said, well, we don't have a work for hire policy. So, um, so uh, the, the people actually wrote the code, the copyright owners uh, owned it. We weren't stupid though. We, uh, we uh, donated, uh, we, we pledged to donate back um, the $300,000 it took to, to write, uh, that, that, that the hospital paid uh, for it thinking we would never, ever have to pay it up. But it turned out the Geometrics was extremely successful. It was, it produced very, this is, this is from 1994, fully 3D image, uh, images. It was excellently designed. Mark Gehring is a genius at, at Interface and um, still is a, a local entrepreneur doing very, very well. You might have heard of a, a, a company called Propeller Health. Mark, Mark was a founder of Propeller Health as well. Well, we built on, um, Again, the treatment planning aspect was extremely important, but, uh, but Paul Record and I, who was, uh, who, Paul was also a, a co-founder of, of Geometrics, uh, we, we ended up selling Gym, Geometrics in 1996 um, to, um, to a company that had actually uh, given us a, an advance against royalties. We were so academically inclined that the only way we knew how to do business was to get an advance against royalties like a book deal. And in 96, the company that had, had, had essentially advanced us the money was squeezing us. So we ended up selling Geometrics uh, to, uh, to that company. By the way, that company is now, that company was sold to Philips, so it's still operated in Madison. Geometrics is still part of Philips Medical, and it's in Fitchburg. Um, by the way, uh, that company ended up dominating the, the until recently, the, the whole area of radiation therapy tre treatment planning. Uh, and uh, we estimate about 2 million people have been, have been treated or have, have used that planning system around the world uh, for radiation therapy. But we had a, we had a, Paul and I had an idea for, for an advanced radiotherapy machine called tomotherapy. And these are some of the very... <clears throat> very uh, complicated uh, dose distribution. So red is a high dose and blue is low dose on these images. You can see that we could sort of sculpt the radiation dose and protect normal tissues. This, this, could never, this was never done before then. Conventional radiation therapy, you blasted it away with a couple of fields. And here we were applying fields from 360 degrees around the patient. And uh, the, the, the system was called tomotherapy. It looks like a CT scanner because it was a CT scanner. So it was the first machine to actually have a built-in CT scanner into the machine. This is what it looked like in 2007. But uh, it had a genesis, of course. So this is what it looked like in 2000. Um, and the backstory here is that um, we, after we sold, um, or, or sorry, before we had, had sold ge geometrics, we had started working on tomotherapy and tried to find a backer for it, an industrial backer. And of course, GE, uh, being in our backyard, was the logical choice. So, so GE funded us from 1994 to 1997. Uh, and unfortunately, they had an accident uh, where one of the service personnel left the machine in an unsafe condition and it ended up killing a patient in Spain. And Jack Welsh owned, the, owned General Electric then, and, and uh, they decided to get out of radiotherapy because they were number four, and they felt, well, you know, this tomotherapy thing looks interesting, but we're, we're cutting our losses. We're getting out. Um, had GE continued, I'm sure they would have uh, got the, a unit out much earlier. But this was the prototype based on a GE CT scanner. Uh, and uh, this was actually built here at the University of Wisconsin at the Physical Sciences Lab. Uh, out in Stoughton, which is one of the great machine shops in, owned by a university in the country. Uh, I was pretty proud of this. We moved it into the clinic uh, uh, in 2001. Uh, you can see the covers um, weren't very sophisticated looking. Uh, it was, the covers were actually done by a boat builder, a local boat builder, mm -hmm. and it was fiberglass, and it, it had flotation between two fiberglass sheets, right? So it was very quiet. 
Uh, and it would, and if it was thrown in a lake, it would float. Uh, uh, but it looked a little, it looks a little clunky. Uh, we also engaged the vet school because um, they have animals to treat too. So they, we have a radiation therapy program in our vet school, and, and this is one of the patients. So dogs get sinus tumors, and so the sinus tumor, the sinus tumors tend to be right between the eyes. And the conventional way to treat it was with two fields that could eradicate the, the tumor, but the animals would go blind. 100% was a side effect, 100% blindness. We showed that you could get 0% blindness and still treat the tumor with tomotherapy. So it was hugely successful. In fact, they have a tomotherapy, a commercial tomotherapy machine at our vet school, one of two in the country that do. The first patient was treated in 2002. Uh, the patient actually on the left. I'm the cameraman for that photo. And the uh, second patient is shown on the right. This is what, a, you know, tomotherapy, you can see our, our very clunky uh, er, early version is not nearly as sophisticated as the commercial version was. Well, we sold the company. Uh, we, we suffered the recession, like many uh, young companies, and it was sold to Accuray. Accuray still runs the company in Madison. In fact, they were a California company and moved their manufacturing to Madison. So it's one of the successes of Madison, at least, that, that you moved a Silicon Valley company uh, to Madison instead of moving the company out of Madison to Silicon Valley. The, uh, after that, um, uh, I started a company with, uh, with Mark Gehring and, and, uh, and two others um, called, called HealthMind. And this is a company that is uh, mining data from medical images, from, from radiology images, because there's, there's information in the data um, that, that the radiologists really, it's very difficult to see, things like texture, um, exotic mathematical constructs like kurtosis. And, uh, and so there's about 500 standard um, image processing uh, metrics that you can harvest from the data to characterize disease. So the idea is to, is to, is to, is to generate information uh, that can describe the phenotype of disease. So the idea is to do what's called quantitative Im uh, imaging, where you're extracting uh, mathematical metrics out of, the, out of the images. Use that for decision support. And then later on, when you have enough data, to actually mine it. Uh, and not just mine it uh, to determine, for example, cohorts of patients uh, that could respond to this drug versus another drug, but, but to actually um, go and define disease in terms of the phenotype of the image. Another uh, company that uh, I've worked on since I've retired is AstoCT. And again, I've had a long relationship with the vet school. So this was with two vets, uh, including the chair of, uh, of, of veterinary medicine, Mark Markell. And the idea was to build, he came, they came to us um, and said, can you build a CT scanner that would scan horse legs? Because horses sleep uh, when they're standing up. And we don't have to put them under general anesthesia and put them into a CT scanner to, uh, to image the legs. We'll be able to just uh, scan them vertically. And they said, yeah, well, that's easy. We just turn it on the side and raise it up and down. And they said, well, you know, it would be really nice if you could turn it 90 degrees and scan their heads, too. So anyway, uh, we did it. Um, and I'll just show you a little video here uh, of what the unit actually looks like. This is our unit uh, at the University of Wisconsin Vet School. Uh, it's the first one. Um, it was installed last October. Scan legs of horses two at a time, or scan the head and neck. The unit was built with safety in mind. In fact, it was built so a horse actually walks across the unit and gets to a central pedestal, and the scanner rises up to scan two legs at once. For diagnosticians like myself, this is a big step forward. It's a great step forward for the profession, for the industry, for the animal's care. And it can be done safely and uh, effectively. The first day was very exciting. We scanned six horses of various breeds and sizes. Of those horses, two of them showed that there was pathology in their legs that weren't identified on radiographs. The installation and assembly was completed mostly on the first day. And by the second day, the unit was up and running. It has rotation speeds of once per second giving you 36 slices per second. And the fan beam CT that's on board allows then accurate 
reconstructions, even if there's slight motion of the horse, like swaying as it's sleeping and standing. We've been waiting a long time. Anyway, you, you can see what the unit's about. So, so, so that you, that that scanner uh, again was was built with with absolutely looking at the requirements for for what horses do, including fertilize uh, the ground around them. So it was it's the first CT scanner that's fully sealed uh, uh, as well. Humans don't do that to scanners, but horses certainly that don't care. Uh, <clears throat> So, so another company that we uh, we uh, we we started uh, is uh, is a company called called Onloom, and uh, fluorescent guided surgery is is something that's uh, that's starting to be used, and the trouble is to see the weak fluorescent signal from markers that that either vascular markers or or can or or tumor markers, you have to turn out the lights, and surgical suites with the lights out aren't a very safe place. So, so we developed a, a lighting system uh, so that you could you could capture the fluorescent glow with the lights off, and it, and it was actually a very simple idea. What you do is you most of the time the lights are off, but the but high performance very bright lights come on for a very short period of time, five or ten percent of the time, ninety or ninety five percent of the time the lights are off, but that that's repeated at one hundred and eighty hertz. So from the, from, the, from the human eye, it looks like the light is nice and steady, but a high-speed camera imaging it sees lo- the, the white light signal and the fluorescent signal. And most of the time, we want to capture the weak fluorescent signal, and so this is the, our solution. Uh, this, this system is, um, is, under, uh, is under FDA approval process now. It's pending FDA approval, and so hopefully it will be approved uh, the contract manufacturer is in um, Waukesha, Wisconsin, and uh, so it's um, it's helping the state. So I'm going to uh, just show you a little another little movie here. Uh, this is um, this is a, a the green. This this is a false color green from the fluorescent signal, and a surgeon is actually cutting out under good well lit conditions the the tumor. Uh, and so you can see how useful this would be to a surgeon. You can also see a little green dot down in the lower, the lower part here, where that, just to the right of that arrow that shows uh, that there's another uh, location for the tumor. And uh, it, it will, it, this, again, this cart is, uh, being, being, uh, was, uh, was designed and built uh, for us in, um, in Waukesha. And the imaging head will be manufactured by Standard Imaging, um, a medical physics startup company that, that uh, um, that's in uh, the uh, west side of Madison. So, um, so, you, so I've talked about both um, large companies uh, taking technology and licensing to large companies uh, and startup companies, and it really depends on the the whether there, there's a risk, a high risk or a low risk profile for the technology, and whether or not um, you're going to make make a lot of money or not uh, out of the technology. So down in this quadrant is the low risk, low reward. So this is a noodle splash preventer. Uh, not much risk in taking this to market, but you're probably not going to make a lot of money. Um, whoops. This is the high risk, low reward. Uh, this is left to governments. Um, so you don't uh, want to have you don't want to, you don't want to be in this sector at all. No no companies should exist in this sector. This is, uh, this is like Chuck Mistretta's, uh, this is digital sub- subtraction and geography. Uh, this is a low risk, high reward, so it's crazy uh, to, to not give this to an existing company, right? Because then you, you uh, will, will uh, not have any business risk, presumably, and the company will accept it because um, it's, it's, got, it's a high reward. This is where tomotherapy was, it's high risk, high reward. But you know, again, the the people who found who who developed this technology, us, um, we um, we did we understood the the risks a lot better than the industry, right? So GE got rid of it, and uh, and left it to us basically. So it was an opportunity. Again, we wouldn't have started Tomotherapy as a company if GE had had kept it. So this is the high risk, um, high reward uh, is the place for startups. And the and the low risk high reward is the place for existing companies. 
So now let me switch gears a little bit and talk about the issues involved in, uh, I call it potential conflict of interest. I like this cartoon. We've come up with a new drug to combat greed, but it's $90 per pill. Um, so, so my relationship between the university is managed by the UW Conflict of Interest Committee. I hate the, I hate the word Conflict of Interest Committee because it doesn't imply that hey, there's something wrong, you're doing something wrong. Um, it should be called Conflict Management because there's no endeavor, there's no human endeavor involving two people. There's, no, there's not a potential conflict. And it's about managing the conflict, right? Anyway. What's good for the company is not necessarily good for the UW and vice versa. And, and disclosure of the financial situation is the first requirement. So I disclosed uh, the companies I was associated with at the beginning of the talk and in all my publications um, that where there's a nexus of interest, I disclose uh, so that people can, can judge for themselves whether or not there's bias. But there's some absolute don'ts. Uh, be responsible for a clinical trial invo involving the company's products. Um, and that's, the word's responsible. I mean, the inventor should always be involved in the design of the trial. But it's the execution of the trial. It's picking the patients. It's writing the results. It's writing the paper where that person shouldn't be uh, in charge. Be responsible for both ends of a contract. And I, I would say you shouldn't even be involved in one end of the contract. But sometimes that's un unavoidable if you're, if you're the sole, sole proprietor of the company. Force your university staff or students to be involved with the company. By the way, many of my students were involved with the company, and I would always say, I don't want you to be involved. I won't supervise you at the company. You've got to talk to the chairman and convince him why it's important for your career, but it's going to take you longer to get your PhD. Okay? And, and I'm, I'm paying for your PhD. If you want to go work for the company, I'm not going to pay you, I'm not going to pay you your stipend if you're not going to working for my project. That's fraud. But, you know, some students wanted to work at the company and, and you know, we would, of course, um, ac acquiesce to their, to, their, to their requests, but me not making the decision. Limit the rights of the university staff or students restricting publications is something that obviously you can't do because students have to publish, they have to get their PhD. By the way, does anyone see anything wrong with those buildings over there? The third tower doesn't exist at Wimmer. I don't know where I got this, but uh, yeah, you don't, want to, you don't want to misrepresent things. Commitment management. I, I, I think we should, call it, uh, we, we should call it conflict management, uh, and I like the word con uh, commitment management, uh, and I like this cartoon as well. I, I used company resources to build my own internet company. Apparently, my low job satisfaction bred disloyalty, which drifted into outright theft, and <laughs> sabotage can't be far away. Well, you know, clearly, clearly, if, if you, if you uh, want to start a company, then uh, you have a potential uh, commitment management problem. So what you need to do is, uh, if you're an academic, uh, is you need to talk to your chairman or the dean or the center director and uh, get a formal agreement um, of some portion of your time. And again, if we go back to the faculty in a fine arts department, there's a there's a there's a full understanding there that, that everyone has a everyone has a studio everyone goes to performances where they're getting paid, and uh, and we still haven't quite come to that accommodation yet, uh, and and it's, there's some cases we can't if you're a if you're a brain surgeon here if you're a neurosurgeon at the University of Wisconsin, you're working all the time on surgery. It's very difficult for you to get time off. Uh, and, and probably you shouldn't, in a way, because your skills are so important. Um, but by the way, very interesting, uh, neurosurgery is one of the most innovative areas of medicine, and we do have uh, academic entrepreneurs that have, have uh, taken time off and, and lower salary uh, so that they could be entrepreneurs. You must not do business at your institution's place of business unless it's part of an agreement between the business and the employer. And there's a, there's a general acceptance now of what's called de minimis use. So if you're making a local phone call, uh, you don't have to run out in a snowstorm on the street corner, use a cell phone for a business call. You can do that if it's not costing the university anything. And if you have a commitment for some of your time. Because once you, the university says that you, you can spend, say, a day a week on, on your consulting or on your company, 
they're essentially taking that commitment inside the university, right? So they're, they're saying, we're taking a risk that you're going to be engaging with society, taking your ideas out into the, into the marketplace, and we're okay with that. Other examples of de minimis use is if the department's not charging for Xeroxing, uh, then, then why should your company, if 20% of your time is being devoted to the company, then, to, you know, and no one's getting charged for the research grants for using the Xerox machine, or, the, or using the blackboard in the conference room when it's not being used. So de minimis use is generally accepted. But when in doubt, the first obligations to your institution. Well, one of the, the important factors, uh, I think, especially here, is that um, you know, startup companies are important uh, for economic health. And you know what? We're just about dead last. Um, this is uh, 2017. Uh, we ranked uh, lowest in the country in uh, startup activity. And startup hubs stimulate economic growth. Uh, it results in better education and infrastructure. Uh, and young people gravitate towards regions of strong startup activity. And um, you know, I should I, I'm proud to say that you know, tomotherapy is very has been very popular in Wisconsin. There's there's uh, 13 operating tomotherapy machines at, ver at, at min most of the cancer centers in the in the state. Um, it's still manufactured uh, by Accurate, as I mentioned. They 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 moved their other product line here as well. We utilize, they use lives, parts suppliers throughout Wisconsin, and there's four, 405 uh, centers, about seven or 800 tomotherapy machines operating in the world. This is the, Accuray uh, revealed to me the, the relative spend. Um, they, they, they didn't want to know what the, the cost of goods was, but this is the, this is the, uh, this is the, the spend of Accuray for its products uh, in Wisconsin, 31% of their cost of goods comes from Dane County. But it's not the biggest, Waukesha County, 44%. And if you uh, add up all of the counties around um, Milwaukee, about two thirds of the um, economic development uh, from, from tomotherapy uh, is in the counties around Milwaukee. And why is that? Well, Milwaukee is still a great manufacturing hub. Um, again, my friend Mark Cook did a similar thing. He looked at the impact of UW agricultural uh, spin-offs, and this is three companies uh, that came up from the school, from uh, from Cal's uh, 20, 29 Wisconsin counties benefited from his spin-off or the, from agricultural spin-off companies, and it just shows uh, the three of them, including one that that Mark uh, started himself. So the uh, a few years ago, in in, uh, in fact, in the in the period of time when we were getting a uh, a $200 million budget cut for the system, the UW-Madison did a budget report uh, that showed what the overall uh, economic impact of the university was. It was about $15 billion. And interestingly, the, the economic, uh, uh, or the state and local revenue from the economic in the impact was $847.5 million coming back to the state coffers. This is state coffers from the $15 billion um, spend from the university and it's including its spin-offs. So it turns out that the, then the university was, was getting from the state 443 million. So that's a pretty nice little business we got here for the state, right? So the university is returning, returning about $1.30 to the state coffers for every dollar spent. And a lot of that is coming from spin-offs. The university has 362 startup companies that have spun off uh, contributing 2.3 billion, so 15 billion uh, is the total, including um, the startups, and 2.3 billion is the startups alone. So a university then uh, is wise uh, to create startups economically for its uh, for its state. So a university then can uh, incubate uh, ideas. Um, in fact, incubation can be for before even a company is formed. Uh, you could then. Uh, provide seed funding for the startup. If you're lucky, that financing then will, will happen uh, and the company can grow. And then if uh, all things go in the right direction, there's some payback. In, a, in the case of medical companies, it's, it's improved healthcare uh, as, well as, uh, as well as money. 
which goes back to help the community. Um, and of course, the community is involved um, often in mentorship of startup companies. We have a business community that's very generous in supplying time. Um, we also have small business innovative research, um, the special re research and development funding from the federal government. And that results ultimately in returns and very often donations. I, I, know, I know almost no academic entrepreneurs that have been successful that haven't generously donated back to the university. So my job now in the Ismuth Project and the Chief Innovation Officer at UW Health is for medical companies to be involved in incubating ideas um, and then finding some seed funding for them, um, trying to find community mentors uh, and, uh, and, and helping them find financing. So the Ismuth Project has a lot of partners. We actually have a pretty nice ecosystem on this campus now. We have groups like the UW Law and Entrepreneurship Clinic, which gives uh, law advice. It's law interns from the law school who are then supervised by practicing lawyers, uh, just like residents in a, in a uh, hospital. But these are, but these are lawyers, to, you know, uh, contracts, um, incorporation documents. Discovery to Product, D2P, um, is, uh, is a, a, a successful program uh, to incubate uh, companies, the startup companies. Forward Bio is um, a program in engineering. The Center for Technology Commercialization uh, is a, is a uh, statewide organization, uh, part of, was part of Extension. And then uh, WeSolve is a, is a group of postdocs. Uh, it's an independent postdoc uh, and graduate student organization that provides consulting uh, to startup companies. And then there's Merlin Mentors. There's a lot of very nice programs to help entrepreneurs. Our, we have drop-in hours at, 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 the, at the Ismuth Project on Mondays and Wednesdays uh, to support uh, people who, who come to us and we, we, we get drop-ins saying, uh, we'd like to figure out, we got an idea, we'd like to do something with it. So examples are, who knew that we had um, the leading surgical coaching group? Um, this will probably be a not-for-profit instead of a for-profit but still adds economic development. Image processing for outcome analysis, um, uh, very similar to HealthMind in some ways, but, but, but clearly different, a different uh, direction. Uh, continuity of transitional care, again, we, got, we have a group um, that, that basically teaches uh, he health systems that um, how, to, how to properly tr uh, transition patients from a hospital back to the home or from the home into a nursing home. Traumatic brain injury assessment. This is something that may be, in fact, uh, a joint program between the athletic department uh, and UW Health. Um, treatment for, I'll just skip a couple, I'll just say one more. Treatment for corneal damage. So a uh, ophthalmologist came into my office and said, I got a cure for corneal ulcers. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a generic drug. It's been known for 100 years. Um, and um, I need to put that into a contact lens, and it can cure corneal ulcers. And they said, "We well, should take it to Wharf." He said, "Well, I did, but you know, it wasn't a new, it wasn't a composition of matter uh, because it was generic drug." And so they passed. Oh, I said, "That's too bad." Have you talked about it? He said, "Well, no, I, I just got a patent myself." Uh, and so he actually filed filed a patent, and he said, "But I don't know. I have no have a clue of how to start a company." So who knows? We'll maybe have a. And he says it's 80% effective I, 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 because, because it's a generic drug. He can, literally, he can literally put it into eyes. He can dilute it and, and uh, put it into a dropper or put it into a vial. The patient puts the drops in her eyes for two hours, and 80% of the time the patient's cured of corneal ulcers, which is debilitating if you, if you have them. So the two accepted projects at this point were fun, helping to, to, to work uh, is ProMaps, and packed, and I'll talk about both of them. ProMaps, has anyone ever heard that physicians are getting burnt out from their EMR? Well, um, uh, Joe Buchanan has a solution. So the trouble with electronic medical records is they were designed to replace paper records. And the trouble, of course, with paper records is that the, the information isn't well organized. And it's relatively easy to flip through paper and find information, but it's hard to click through screens to find information. So he's finding a way to, better way to organize it. 
So we're, we're funding that. So it, it, it's, it, uh, ProMaps is short for Problem Concept Maps. Uh, and uh, so a brilliant, brilliant guy. Um, another extreme, not another genius, fellow Canadian actually, uh, Jacques Gallopo, um, is, is, a, is the uh, PI at the Program for Advanced Cell Therapy. So Jacques um, has got technology, it's amazing technology. So, so what you do is transplant patients uh, have, are immune suppressed by definition, right? So, so they, they can get simple viruses, viruses that would give you a common cold or a flu will kill patients or, 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 or force the physicians to, to, not, to uh, not have the patient take the immune rejection or the immune suppression drugs in order for their body to fight the infection. But that results in the loss of the organ or in a bone marrow transplant, you know, a near death condition. So Jacques does the same thing that you would do uh, for the original bone marrow transplant um, uh, donor or for the or organ donor. He goes and finds, um, he goes and finds um, relatives tends to be relatives uh, of the of the um, the patient, the sons and daughters, or or brothers and sisters who who have a similar um, uh, genetic uh, a similar um, uh, immune Im Im immune uh, what's it called uh, Dave help me uh, uh, in other words a matched a matched donor and just extracts blood from them and he can go and find the the T cell, right? The white, white blood cell that carries that particular um, um, viral um, uh, antibody, right? And, half, and and these are very common diseases. So, you know, uh, the the one he's working on is cytomegalovirus first, CMV. Fifty percent of people have antibodies to CMV. He finds those cells that are expressing the antibodies grows them up to 25,000 cells per kilogram body weight and inject it into the patient who is fighting that viral infection. And it's very specific. It just goes after the virus but doesn't bring the immune system up to full competency, right? So and it works about 80, 80 to 90 percent of the time. Fantastic. <coughs> so that's the kind of technology we're going to try to spin out as a company. So how could the academic entrepreneurial climate be improved? Uh, well, here's some, here's some examples, ideas. Uh, encourage domain-specific business and entrepreneurial training classes. Develop incubator programs for promising technologies. Uh, uh, get approved faculty commitment to entrepreneurial, brings responsibilities for fairness and openness. So I think, um, you know, once a, 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 once a entrepreneur is, uh, is approved to work on their company inside the university, then the university should be really getting behind them, I think. Because after all, uh, they're not, in most cases, their salary isn't changing, uh, and the university is taking some responsibility for, uh, and some risk, if you like, uh, but hope in hope of a reward um, for society. What's very important is bean counting. So deans, chairs, and center directors should report the startup met metrics for the chancellor or president. And, uh, and by the way, in the memo that would go to them, they would say that startups are a good thing, not a bad thing. You might have to tell them that. Uh, rationalize conflict management protocols. Um, and again, I like the word conflict management. Um, and just make them so that uh, one can operate in the same way uh, as you would for a grant. Engage alumni to create a seed fund for startup companies. Uh, we don't have a, a university seed fund through our uh, foundation, and, and that's their policy, and, and, that's, and that's fine. But I think we need to create one, because I think uh, th there's, uh, there's good investments uh, here, and I think the alumni would like to have what I would call at least a three-way return, a return on investment, a return to help the university, and a return to help their community. And I think we should just declare ourselves an entre entrepreneurial university. And uh, other universities have, and I really like this definition of an entrepreneurial university from a, from, um, from a small university in Denmark. 
It's a knowledge generating and culture bearing institution that contributes to technological, economic, social, and cultural innovation in the surrounding society through entrepreneurship and the communication and exchange of knowledge. Doesn't that sound like the Wisconsin idea? So let's, uh, some takeaway thoughts. We need to reverse Wisconsin's poor startup performance by facing the problem broadly. Wisconsin's business economy should be more vibrant. It's all about jobs, jobs. Every election here is about jobs, jobs, and jobs. Uh, it's analogous to soil depletion of the, of the 1880s. It's now time to add some fertilizer to both existing and new companies. And entrepreneurialism excites millennials and we need to keep our young people in the state. In fact, I think entrepreneurship classes should be the, 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 the new English 101 that's taught universally. And I think, I think students would come here, the best students would come here if we did that. So we should declare ourselves an entrepreneurial university and add, add, add economic development to the complementary missions of education, research, and community service. So thank you very much. So I'd be delighted, I'd be upset if you didn't ask questions. Yes? With rising health care costs, how do you uh, uh, look at the conflict of preventative health care versus treatment, and uh, is that part of a social impact investment that you... No, absolutely, absolutely. Your, your, your question's about, uh, about isn't, uh, isn't saving money uh, a very important part of health care? And yes, it is. So, so for example, Onloom, is not selling its product, is not gonna sell its product for, for the hospital to make more money. It's being sold for it to, to save money. And it, it, will, it will shorten the time of surgery um, and it will, it will prevent uh, resurgeries. So for example, in breast, in breast surgery, about a third of the time, well, not quite a third, 25 to 30% of the time, you need a second surgery in breast surgery because the, the, the tumor the margins at the tumor aren't free because they take out the tumor and they inspect its surface to make sure there's no tumor at the surface. So the pathologist, it takes some time to do that. And so they often have to go back uh, in. So if you could actually see as you take it out that there's nothing glowing on the surface, they'll get an in, a better indication that they've got all the tumor. I guess my question is more is not to have breast cancer in the first place. Oh yes, no, 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 I see what you mean. I see what you mean, yes, no, and. And you know, and uh, unfortunately, genetics is part of part of the answer. Um, you know, you know, um, uh, uh, there are there are certain certain ethnic groups that have very high rates of breast cancer. I'm Scottish. Scottish happen to be Scottish women happen to be ones with relatively high rates of breast cancer. So it's not always something we can prevent. Yes. What are the characteristics of Wisconsin that be so low in entrepreneurship? Versus what the other states. So, I mean, what, what are they doing differently than Wisconsin? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's not all of Wisconsin. Again, we have a strong, vigorous startup hub in Madison. So Madison is, is, is not reflective of the whole state. And let me say something first, is that one of the very important things the state should remember is don't be jealous of Wisconsin, or of Madison, right? Try to emulate Madison, but, but don't feel that the elite live here and... And this is, uh, you know, this is uh, a place that, that won't help the rest of the state. Startup companies, entrepreneurial activity here do, do help the whole state. Now why, but, but your question was, why, why do we have uh, a relatively poor rate of startup? Uh, I, I, think it's, I think it's a little historical. I think that we've had very large, we've had at one point in time, we had incredible entrepreneurs by definition, right? We had great companies here like Harley-Davidson, start. We had, um, you know, GE moved uh, to, to uh, Wisconsin from Chicago, uh, G Medicals, uh, the, the, the medical device division. By the way, it, it moved there for a very practical reason. It needed glassware for x-ray tubes, that, and so there was glass blowing in Milwaukee because of the beer industry. So, so, so that was a lucky coincidence. The beer industry is a good example of entre entrepreneurship. But, but for whatever reason, you get sort of satisfied with yourself. And until, until 1980, you could get a job. Well, I mean, why bother with entrepreneurship? You go get a good job, feed your family by working with the existing industry. 
It's taken us a while. And then we lost a lot of population. Uh, we've, we have a problem with keeping young people here now. And, and so uh, if you don't keep the young people, you don't keep entrepreneurs. And that's a very simple reason. is because when you graduate from a university, you, you're not used to a big salary. You, don't have a, you, don't have, you probably don't have a big family. And you can, you can risk, you can take a risk and start a company. And so a lot of, a lot of startup companies are heavily weighted towards young people. Uh, and so, so, so we have a source of young people in this city, and the startup community is attracting them. I mean, Epic's a really good example. If you go into Epic's, if you go into Epic, you hardly see a 40-year-old, right? It's 20s and 30-something work in that company. And, and uh, the other reason is we need a strong arts community. We need a strong, we need a place to raise families. We need a, a, a good place. Uh, we have a reason. A, a, we want to, you have to have a city where people want to live in. And Ma Madison fits that bill. Yes? Could I ask for a clarification? Is Wisconsin last in startups? Dead last. It was dead last in, in 2017. Okay, because you said we were relatively low. That's absolutely low. No, yeah, it was the worst. It was dead last. <laughs> and I don't think we should do that. And that's after having eight years of a governor who said Wisconsin was open for business and did everything within his power yeah. to deal with that. Yeah, and we're still last. Yeah, in 2017 we we're last. I think okay. I think I think the, I think last year we 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 were not dead last. Okay, but I, I just want to clarify, we aren't relatively low. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's it's very it's very interesting. You can you can look at that map and and uh, you can correlate it also. The west the west is a lot more entre entrepreneurial. Um, the 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 southeast is a lot less entrepreneurial. Uh, New York, New York is very entrepreneurial. Uh, so is so is uh, Massachusetts and Vermont. The, the liberal the liberal states tend to be quite uh, quite entrepreneurial, progressive if, if you like the word. Yes. So what does Las Vegas have that makes it so entrepreneurial? Yeah, I don't know. It's that, uh, that well, just doesn't seem. I know to exactly. No, it's very entrepreneurial. It's it, it, well. I mean, one of the reasons. Uh, an another reason is some people really like to live there. Housing prices are low. Uh, schools actually aren't bad in, in, in Las Vegas. They get a lot of money from the gambling industry to help 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 taxes. Well, the weather is nice. I mean, there's lots of other reasons, and and it's become an entrepreneurial. It really has become an entrepreneurial. And there's money there. There there is there's venture capital there. Yeah, it's 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 really humming. Silicon Valley is actually a little on the on the downside because it's too it's too expensive. Yes. What does teaching academic academic What does academic, so in other words, teaching entrepreneurship, what does that look like? Within an academic center. Yeah, within an academic center. Well, it would be, for example, having classes in most fields of, of what it's, I mean. Uh, that, that give the, the constraints of that particular field. Um, uh, so for example, in the field of medical devices, we, you know, we need to worry about FDA, we, you need to worry about, about how, you, how people are gonna pay for your devices, it's gonna save money, reimbursements in some way. Uh, the project management, teaching project management, academics are lousy at project management, right? And the reason for that is we do too much divergent thinking and not, much, not enough convergent thinking. And there's difference between it, right? It's the, you know, the blue sky is all about universities and focusing and solving particular problems is much, tends to be, needs a lot of detailed management of scope, schedule, and budget that we really lack in university. Rock, could you check your uh, audio because uh, the PA system seems gone off. Oh, is it blinking? I don't know. It's, it's red. Oh, bad, maybe it's the battery is dead. But I'll keep the recording this now. No, but it's still being uh, oh. recorded. So. Oh, okay. so let me, uh, it, it looks like the battery's totally dead. Um, but anyway, yes. What is your relationship with what? Well, Wharf is a great institution. So, so um, uh, I have uh, fifty. I'm more than fifty patents, and I would say say eighty percent are, are through Wharf. Yeah. So, so my personal relationship is very good with Wharf. I think I think they're they're a tremendous organization, and and uh, and Wharf, people people have forgotten what Wharf, Wharf's mission really is. Wharf's, Wharf's got two missions. 
uh, to help the University of Wisconsin um, and to help inventors um, get patents and license them. And of course, when they license them, they generate revenue that will help the university. But they've done something very wise, I think. They haven't, they don't, in any given year, they don't give all their returns back to the university. They've kept a, a war chest over the years. They've built it up so that they can, they can um, protect uh, their patents uh, from lawsuits. And tomotherapy, by the way, was, was challenged by Siemens in Germany. Um, and Worf uh, fought, fought them in a German court. And then Siemens appealed again in a German court, and Worf spent the money to go in and and uh, and win, and they won it. And um, and so you know again they they were returned handsomely on the war, on the tomotherapy patents, uh, but it it uh, it requires a, a strong uh, strong war chest to defend your patents. And um, also, if you build up an endowment like they have. When the university really needs the money, they can put more money in. So when we lost $200 million, uh, Wharf stepped up and increased the amount of money. In fact, the impact to UW was $70 million, and they helped a lot in uh, providing extra money. T Tom? In your one passage when you're talking about the uh, programmers going from the university <coughs> to the company, you said something about we don't have a provision of Work for product. A work for hire. Work for hire. Can you explain to people what that yeah. is? But I think the University of Wisconsin Madison is it's unique. unique. It's okay. unique. Yeah, you, it's nearly unique. Uh, so yeah, we don't have a work for hire pro uh, provision. So if you work for a normal company, you walk in the door, uh, all your inventions are owned by the company, and that's true of universities too. If you're a faculty member at a university, you don't own your IP. The university does, and the university made a decision a long time ago that. And it was based on, um, it was based on uh, the university normally wouldn't take the revenues from a book deal, the royalties from a book deal, away from a professor. And, they, and somebody said, well, why should you be, why, why should you be taking the, the royalties from a licensing deal? And uh, so the university says, yeah, no, that's a good point. We won't. And, uh, and, and, uh, but the buy dole Act came along, and the university had to pick who their who their check transfer agent was for federal funds. So now, if you if you have federal dollars, you your invention has to be taken to Wharf. But you know, war, but lots of I mean, Geometrics, my first company, there was no federal money in it, and uh, so we didn't have to take it to Wharf, uh, and didn't. And is that one of the reasons the Mortgage Institute um, is a private? Yeah. So, so yeah. So, mortgages, mor mortgage was set up for two reasons, really. One of them was to protect um, academic freedom, because if you forget the, when it was created, there was a heavily he heavy uh, threat that we would ban stem cell re research in this in the state uh, or at the state universities, and uh, it was to protect uh, Jamie Thompson. That was. I would think that was the number one reason. But there was an also an opportunity to do things a little bit differently, not be, not for 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 investigators not to uh, be so grant near term grant driven, but you could have a bigger bigger vision, and so uh, yeah, so so the five years I spent there was a fabulous place. So I worked on 155 projects throughout the university uh, with other people, and and Kevin Alisari, who many of you know, has taken over my position there. And he's doing the same thing. So he's, it's really a, a catalyst for, for instrumentation uh, for the whole university. Yeah, uh, yes, the front first. I think uh, <clears throat> the way we teach education, not only for uh, medical students who get the MD, just like they have MD, PhD, where PhD students want to teach and research. Can we think of any MD program where the students, as they are going through medical school, there is an entrepreneurial bent given to that so that they can explain, just like the heart surgeon Devaki invented so many tools, mm -hmm. so that the students are there and we can call it PhD entrepreneurial fellowship. That would be fantastic. You know, I, I've. In our faculty lab, if you look at engineering <laughs> and computers, people like uh, uh, Bill Gates. Zuckerberg, it just dropped out of uh, freshman class 
and went on to invent new, new things. But I guess the same thing cannot be said of medical. It's so difficult. <clears throat> Another thing, whatever you invent in medical has a longevity because the disruptive technologies don't affect it for a long time. Right. As opposed to consumer-based software or hardware companies yeah. where the, the risk is high right. and the failure rates can be high. Right. Yeah, no, no, uh, well, your first point, uh, first, uh, wouldn't it be nice if med students and residents uh, learn, learn something about entrepreneurship? In fact, we have a group uh, of, of med students that self-organized, and they, they're teaching themselves entrepreneurship. Uh, so there's a club, if you like, an entrepreneurial club in the med school of medical students. So, so we're starting. Um, and then, then you're absolutely right about the long, take the, lo the long time it takes to get any kind of products into into use in medicine. It's, I, I, I say it's a half a generation of a, of a physician, right? You you get the young the, the young people that 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 adopt a new technology first. The 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 older physicians they just want to retire. They don't want to bother learning anything new, and it takes about a half a generation to move new technology forward. Yes, you mentioned that uh, Madison has got a rather proficient use of startups and WARF working along with them. Is there an effectiveness with WARF uh, via a statewide level? Though? So, th so there is a there is a um, there is a companion um, uh, state uh, WARF uh, program, and uh, it's it's run through the uh, through the uh, through through the regions through the through the central administration, and of course they don't have the war chest that WARF has. They they partner with Wharf. Wharf is their big brother. Wharf, you know, help, help helps them assess technology and so on. And then Milwaukee, uh, UWM has their own Wharf-like institution, tech transfer institution. But again, you know, we we were the first tech transfer institution in the world at Wharf in 1925. So we have this great great history, and and again, this war chest has been slowly built up um, over over the years to to help the inventors and the university. So. So it's going to take another hundred years for my, uh, the rest of the state to kind of catch up to whatever you want. Well, I mean, if if uh, if if the government would give three billion dollars to the state to the to the rest of the state for to create a wharf, it wouldn't take that time. You know, if you if you think about it, uh, again, the return from the university to the state is so large that the state that the state government should think of ways that 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 they can capitalize on. On, on this great resource. We are the engine of the state. I mean, we make money for the state. We make, we, and by make money, I mean we, we return tax dollars. Every dollar spent, again, is a buck thirty back. So, so, so the question, of course, you don't want to waste money, but you could say, let's use this engine. We've already got this engine. It, could we margin, add another margin of 10% more spending to the university and get, and get correspondingly um, you know that that thirty percent return, and so that's the question that needs to ask. I, I think the question of how do we cut the budgets is the wrong question. The question is how do we how do we rationalize the budgets and how do we capitalize on this 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 enterprise and do exactly what a business would do? How can we marginally increase the state revenues by 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 giving more money to the university? Yes. Has any study or any project undertaken to say mimic uh, Stanford University or Berkeley in terms of how their graduates become great entrepreneurs? Whether we can mimic it in yeah. Wisconsin? Yeah. Well, in terms of entrepreneurship, Stanford has an advantage, right? They started before us, so with Hewlett and Packard um, and, and uh, Shockley uh, Electronics. And we're talking about the 50s, right? So they, they had a strong, robust entrepreneurial program programs back then. So it takes time, but I think I think if you if you come back to the University of Wisconsin in uh, in 20 years, you'll you'll see a, a much more robust startup uh, enterprise here. Maybe maybe as long as we don't somehow slip back, uh, more like Stanford or or MIT, which is another great one. There's a question over yes, in the back. You had a risk versus reward matrix, and I wonder if you would include in that the, the challenge of interdisciplinary science and the language barrier between the team members of your company, a startup company. 
Yeah, no, I, I talk about this a lot. I, I say that, uh, that you know what, uh, to these scientists, right? And, and I'd say, you know, if, if you go into a company, your marketing manager is not a scientist, right? Your salesman is not a scientist. In fact, uh, likely it's not your salesman as an English lit major or, or, or maybe a psychology major. And your, and your marketing manager was, was probably in the fine arts department, right? And so if you really want entrepreneurialism to, to flourish, then let's get the students from, from all these fields together um, in, in entrepreneurial clubs so that they can learn from each other and they can learn, their, they can learn the, the corresponding skills that really require to, uh, to, uh, to start businesses and be successful. Yeah, it's a lot about communication. And, uh, and again, you know what, I, I tell, there's, there's an engineering uh, uh, entrepreneurial club. Uh, and they're, they're, they're the, in fact, the largest entre engineering entrepreneurial club in the, in the, uh, in the country. And they have, they, have a pri they, have a pri they have prizes that they give out, and I was at their award cer ceremony. It's the largest amount of prizes that they give for, for, um, for this uh, um, club. $85,000 worth of prizes they give out. Um, and I, I tell them, you know, you, need, you guys need to go and, and recruit some people from humanities and from the arts uh, to, to, to join your club because you're then gonna, gonna get great, some great creative ideas. It's the collision of these ideas that, that are gonna generate uh, successful businesses. And that's why it should be the 101, that's why it should be the new English 101. Yes. Yeah, just, I just read something that was in the paper I think last week did a survey of millennials, and and uh, the survey showed that seventy percent of the male millennials think they're going to be millionaires in their lifetime. Well, they will because of inflation, but <laughs> <laughs> and the, on the female side, it's like thirty percent. Hmm. So there's the difference, and I'm wondering if, if millennials, in, uh, you know, entrepreneurship excites millennials, but. But it seems like their their reality, how they're living now, which is worse than we did at a, at that age, versus the reality of the the illusion that they may become millionaires causes a problem in the not working hard enough or not having the skill set to take advantage of. Yeah, you know, I think I think one of the reasons why millennials uh, think that they'll be entrepreneurs and, and must know entrepreneurship is that we don't have the job security we used to, and so people are really forced to scramble when they get laid off. They got to they they've got to have a lots of different shots on goal, and include, and it's not just about trying to find another job, but it may be uh, starting their own business. So that's just the reality. I mean, most most millennials were probably facing a career of you know twenty thirty jobs. If you go, I mean, it's very interesting to go and if any of you use LinkedIn, so 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 just go and look at the at the at the at the uh, time people spend on jobs, and the young people are spending a year or two on jobs. They're having to jump around because they're getting laid off, mergers, acquisitions, and uh, people pe people lear having to learn how to scramble. Gwen? Do you think that that, uh, that dynamic? Because if people are having all the, are experiencing different domains and different types of jobs, and they can cross pollinate a lot more things, will that have you know? We think of that as like, oh, it's a bummer. They have to keep having all this mobility, but potentially that could that churn could be positive. I, I don't know. Yeah, no, I think I think uh, learning how to to land on your feet is a, is a great life skill, and um, and I think we were all kind of we probably. Our, our, our economy has been at least partly driven by the fact that of the uncertainty in the economy um, or, this, or the uncertainty in personal life because people are forced to be a little more creative, I think, now. Um, I, know, I know my kids, I mean, they, they, they think that they're going to be doing all kinds of things in their life and they, they're willing to move around. Well, thank you for coming out on such an awful evening. <laughs>